We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm delighted to bring you a fantastic panel of speakers to talk about whether it is time for a new era in the open access movement. Um, before I introduce them, I'll just set the stage a little bit. So research publishing is, is more important, more lucrative and more broken than most people realize. Uh, worldwide, we spend about a trillion dollars of public money on research every year. And this is rising fast due to growing research output in BRICS and other emerging economies. Whole careers can be spent making incremental improvements to research methods. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on a single clinical trial. And yet the global system for sharing research is a costly mess. In 2022, the five biggest publishers had a combined revenue of almost $8 billion with profit margins up to 38%. They made only 31% of their articles open access, so that's without a paywall. Uh, and publication charges could be as high as uh, $12,000 for a single article alone. So all of this means that taxpayer-funded public research is too often locked behind paywalls and researchers without the funds to publish are too often prevented from doing so. Now, these issues manifest as a systemic global challenge, meaning that research is less impactful and less equitable than it could be. Uh, and by locking out the general public, we also undermine public trust and create space for misinformation. Uh, we have seen two decades of initiatives towards making research available open access and with some successes. Uh, but there's increasing recognition that the model of paying high publishing fees to make individual articles available without paywalls is not the answer, particularly not for those in low and middle income countries. And there are excellent examples of low cost, open digital publishing platforms coming from emerging economies. And so I'm delighted to welcome Ashley Farley, who is a program officer in knowledge and research services at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to talk about the new approach by the foundation to pursue much needed change in research publishing. Uh, just as we get Ashley's slides up, let me also tell you about some recent publications you might be interested in. So today we have a blog with the same uh, title as this event, um, which discusses some of the, the changes. We have a what we call a CGD note, which is a sort of just slightly longer commentary article uh, titled The One Trillion Dollar pa Paradox, Why Reforming Research Publishing Should Be a Global Priority. That's by me and Sophie Gulliver. And there's a Nature Index commentary uh, on how to level the global publishing playing field by Tom Karaoke and Elizabeth Marincola, who's one of our panelists. Uh, and just lastly, after Ashley speaks, uh, I'll invite the panelists to share some opening comments and then we'll turn to Q&A. So please start thinking about your questions. Uh, you can find a Slido link wherever you're watching, either in the web page if you're on the CGD website or on the chat on YouTube if that's where you're watching. Okay, so now without further ado, over to Ashley. Thanks. Can I confirm that you can see my screen? Yeah, okay. we can see it. Awesome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share a policy refresh today. In the next 10 minutes, I'll cover kind of where we've been, uh, where we're going, and the next steps in that process. 
So where we've been, 2025 uh, signals a decade of open access policy for the foundation. And the uh, open access movement has been instrumental uh, for the foundation in trying to solve many of the problems that uh, we are aiming to solve globally. And we really believe too that it empowers uh, researchers to be able to share their work and to be able to participate in the research ecosystem more broadly. So here's the timeline of our open access experience. Uh, and we have taken a lot of what we've learned in the past decade, both with our own data internally, as well as listening to uh, external experts and advocates and trying to really push for change in the publishing ecosystem. Our initial policy launched in, in 2015. At the time, it was very much if there was an open access option, uh, we would pay it. And that uh, often meant that some of the journals our grantees uh, were looking to publish in, especially for career advancement, were not considered compliant journals. And the theme of uh, career incentives and in, in, uh, the academic incentive system is a, is a thread throughout all of the work that we do. And while there's been a lot of movement and advocacy to try to change that, uh, that has been, um, I think, a barrier that's been very hard to shift over the past decade. Uh, we also launched Gates Open Research in 2016, uh, which I think is a really strong example of where we could go with, with publishing and knowledge sharing. It's a very innovative, fully open post-publication peer-reviewed platform. Uh, we joined Coalition S in 2018, which uh, then uh, Plan S came live in January 1st, 2021. Uh, it was definitely difficult to change a policy during a global pandemic, uh, but it was a really strong example of why change was needed. You know, we saw a lot of paywalls come down, data flow much more freely as we all tried to quickly source and find interventions and understand the space that uh, we were in. But, you know, for four years later, we've seen a lot of the that uh, openness kind of recede and, and go back to the status quo, uh, which is a bit concerning. Uh, and and in that point, too, we're, we're, we've been shifting our policy to try to make sure that we have as many options available for our grantees to publish where we need to, especially as we know that's important for career advancement. Um, but then, you know, it's been harder to achieve that real shift to full open access as the norm. And uh, also kind of highlighting, and there's many, many more examples that are not on this timeline of external movements like UNESCO publishing recommendations on open science. Uh, in this next slide, you'll see mention uh, other funder groups in the uh, Office of Science, Technology and Policy Nelson memo. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, a real shift. And I think it's important that there's uh, collective action in really driving that change. Um, and what have we learned over the this decade of open access? So we've seen kind of from a policy perspective, I'm a huge believer in policy and I think it needs strong uh, implementation and, and kind of compliance support to be really successful. We've seen it uh, that rise, but we've kind of hit a point where it's flattened. We see that often publishers can be slow to change and definitely have pushback when revenue is, is threatened. And in this kind of article processing charges or APC, world we've seen a lot of that compliance driven by the publishers because they know that we will pay um, and we really want to see our grantee authors kind of take ownership in in sharing uh, different versions of their articles and making sure open access is is achieved as kind of the forefront of what they're doing and not a, a byproduct and because apcs have become so dominant uh we've seen that the other models are, are slow to gain traction or gain adoption and I think, uh, you know, overall in the past, especially five years, I think the pandemic spurred this as well. There's a real community agreement that APCs are inequitable and costs are continuing to rise uh, year over year. There's also other discussions, uh, which I think is most interesting when we think about what publishing uh, could be uh, now and in the future is more of a publish, review, curate. Uh, and I think uh, preprints are kind of a cornerstone of making that happen and that the uh, community really benefit from a new curation model for trust and verification of the research, especially at kind of the volume that we're looking at and thinking at. And the traditional uh, publishing system had a hard time keeping up during COVID and, and moving forward. 
And while today, you know, just focusing on kind of the, the article or the, the manuscript, the, that thing, we are not focusing on open data, which is a much broader, broader topic, but very important. The data is really what we want access to, to be able to uh, further and build upon research, but underlying data often uh, lags when it comes to publications. And again, just highlighting that alliances with similar funders really help accelerate this change. So together we've ignited tangible change in scholarly publishing, but our journal towards equity and knowledge remains unfinished. And as part of our mission to promote equity for all people around the world, we must work towards a more uh, inclusive future in research dissemination. And that's where we are trying to head. So our vision is really to foster a publishing ecosystem that's equitable and inclusive. And we hope that some of these changes help inspire a cultural shift away from prestige and privilege in publishing to one that champions equity and access above all. And so how are we trying to do this? And I will say that, you know, we don't think that this is the end all be all most sustainable version of an open access policy, but we think it's a really critical pivot to help us uh, get there and to stop kind of relying on the current norms that um, I think have stymied us in progress. So first we're going to require posting of a preprint. So as with other iterations of you know, the policy, we really first focused on that version of record. Then, you know, we've had the rights retention strategy and really trying to promote the sharing of the author accepted manuscript. Um, and, and that can be at times fraught due to publisher policies or actions. So now uh, we were really being intentional, being upfront and posting uh, preprint, and that's at no cost uh, to the reader. Uh, or the author. Of course, we do acknowledge that it does cost to publish, uh, but we've really, you know, had, I think, a hard time trying to understand what those business models should look like and what that level of support uh, should be appropriately and how we make sure it's equitable for everyone involved. So on that note, we are discontinuing support for the individual article processing charges and really trying to be intentional in saying that the per article and unit basis is what we really want to get away from. Uh, and then that then takes us into our third pillar, which is how do we reinvest and use our funding that we have uh, to be able to foster that more equitable and sustainable pub open access publishing ecosystem? How can we make sure that when we are using our money, we are also helping to support underfunded or unfunded authors and research globally? This is a, a short slide kind of on, on if you're new to preprints or, you know, as we're having conversations with program staff and grantees, you know, and introducing them to what preprints are. So kind of the early versions of sharing uh, often haven't undergone formal peer review yet, but in early posting, uh, you can get broad and early community feedback. Uh, the timeliness is one of the critical components for us. Um, so they're shared as soon as they're ready to be to be shared with the world. Uh, and then we can post them on open access or preprint server with a CC by license. Uh, why do they matter? One of the most important things I think is that uh, preprints are journal agnostic. So as we really try to, to change and shift the career incentive system, um, you know, this will allow the research to really be evaluated and stand on its own separate from a uh, journal brand or title. Uh, they enable researchers to cite and build upon research much more quickly. And we are seeing policies and practices shift where you can cite these things now in, in new works or in funding calls or progress reports. And I think that's really important to see. So here's our top kind of five facts. So, you know, um, the clause has been in all grant agreements since 2015, so it will be affected by the change. Uh, we work really hard to educate and follow up with and help uh, grantees to be able to uh, easily comply. And we're always looking at how do we improve processes and infrastructure to make that happen. And we follow up to make sure that there's an open access version of the articles available. Uh, we really focus on retaining copyright, especially with the, the CC BY and open licensing. That's very important. I mean, it's, I think to me, open access, you know, it's great to not have that financial barrier, but I also think the ability to easily reuse uh, without legal or financial constraints is, is critical for having broader impact. Uh, no article processing charges will be supported for submissions after January 1st, 2025, and we will be uh, shifting towards the alternative publishing support models. 
And really trying to, again, and always stress that we really don't want the policy to, you know, impact where grantees publish necessarily if they need to for their um, careers, but we're really focusing on the research it, itself. And so next steps is we've internally announced it. Uh, today we are externally announcing it. It goes live uh, through the Foundation's Ideas blog post at 1 p.m. Um, uh, Pacific Standard Time, so uh, our website and everything will be refreshed at that point. And then we'll be really working on socializing, answering questions, um, and, and getting everyone ready for the policy launch to kick off in January 1st, 2025. And I will stop there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, it's, a, it's a bold and interesting shift, and I'm looking forward to hearing what the panel has to, to say about it, as well as any reflections on, on sort of research publishing shifts more broadly. So I'll now introduce the panel. Um, so first we have Justice Novignon, who is the Head of Health Economics and Financing at the Africa Centers for Disease Control. We have Charlotte Watts, who is the Chief Scientific Advisor and Director of Research and Evidence at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And lastly, uh, we have Elizabeth Marincola, uh, who is a Senior Advisor for Open Science at the Science for Africa Foundation. Welcome to you all. Okay, so let me start uh, with you, Justice. So as both the leader at Africa CDC, where you support um, countries to draw on evidence and a professor yourself, have we lost justice? Just if you can hear me, Justice, before I pitch up your question. Thank you. Great. Okay, let me try. It sounds like we might have a bit of a lag here, but so as both as a both a leader at Africa CDC, where I know you support countries to draw on evidence, and a professor yourself. So you've seen this from sort of two sides. What's your view on the experience of researchers and research users in African countries and the shift that the foundation is making? Can you hear me, Tom? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks for that presentation, Ashley. Um, research, publishing, and promotion of evidence-informed policies really largely depend on um, on how we correct some inefficiencies and inequities in the publication landscape. You know, for academics and researchers in low and middle income countries, actually publications are a lifeline to them. Um, they get promoted <laughs> based on uh, how much work and what, what quality of work they do and put out there through publications. Um, their whole careers depend on that, really. Now that we, especially at Africa CDC, are promoting evidence-informed policy making. Policy makers need access to published work, evidence, um, and we've seen that, that during COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the work, in fact, a lot of the decisions that have been taken now by the Africa CDC and other people really are based on, um, on, on, on evidence. So access is also important. But there are three pronged, there's a three pronged problem. One, um, as a researcher, you need to pay, you do your work, you carry out your work, you prepare your manuscripts, but you need to pay to publish. I think that has come out clearly. And as, an, as, as a policymaker, for you to access the evidence, you need to pay to read or pay to access. Recently, I had a problem myself. There was a paper I was looking for to review and I didn't have access to that. I had to send emails to friends in high-income countries to access those papers for me at Africa CDC. Um, so, so, so that is a big problem. The other challenge we have is that as a researcher who needs to pay to publish your own work, you know, someone pays and submits the work, you are then invited <laughs> to review that work. But to do that pro bono, Essentially, not 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 uh, recognized in any way from 
from a publisher who has taken money published, who will put out a paper behind a paywall, but then is not recognizing you for reviewing that work. So these are problems that you know lead to a lot of inequity. And I'm very glad that the Gates Foundation, you know, a leader in this space and a voice, I believe, is coming up with these uh, with, with this policy now. Um, to help correct some of those things, because unfortunately, um, the development partner community, the funding community, I believe, has been uh, behind <laughs> some of these these practices persisting. And if we can get big funders like the Gates Foundation, FCDO, Welcome Trust, and others really support this policy of open access, uh, this policy of people being able to publish, um, first of all, making the publications. Um, open through preprints, but also going a step further to, to tell journals that, look, we are not going to pay to get our grantees published there. Um, I believe this will go a long way to correct some of the problems we have. Um, but clearly, uh, we do have a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, these issues we've raised. And correcting the inequity does not end with talk. It actually ends in action. And I do hope that the action that the Gates Foundation has taken, um, and I do expect the Gates Foundation over the next couple of years to make very clear statements to beyond saying that your, you put out your paper through a preprint, that we are not going to pay for you to publish in any particular journal. Um, I, I believe this would help correct some of those challenges. So for me, it's a welcome news. And uh, I do expect um, a lot more proactive uh, measures from other funders as well. Over to you, Tom. Great, thank you, Justice. Uh, and I know there's a sort of increasing amount of African-led uh, uh, open research publishing platforms that are uh, coming out as well. Um, okay, Charlotte, let me turn to you. Uh, so you are also an academic previously, as well as a, a leading figure in UK development research. Um, so, you know, in your view, should global research publishing system be be a high priority in sort of recognizing that FCDO or DFID before that has had a long history of championing open access, uh, sort of having one of the earliest open access policies and a long history of supporting research system strengthening as well. Yeah, thanks. And um, I'm really delighted to be joining this conversation. Um, and um, really, uh, you know, from that from the UK perspective, we strongly believe that publicly funded research is a global public good and that fundamentally it should be accessible to all irrespective of ability to pay. Um, in the UK, we've made advances on our open access initiatives. So for example, in 2021, UKRI, so the UK Research Councils, as well as um, the National Institute of Health Research published new access policies. And at FCDO, um, for the research that we support, we require immediate open access publication as a requirement in all of our um, development research funding. Um, so we're fully supportive of the call for urgent universal access to scholarly, scholarly scientific knowledge. Um, and, you know, like others, just believe this is a really important issue um, uh, and, and recognise the inequalities and, and uneven playing field um, and the, how that's impacting in lower middle income countries ability to access the latest science and research. Um, we really sort of are, are pleased to be here in this conversation and joining this um, because we believe we need to go further and faster. Um, the current system, um, we believe, prevents equitable participation and it, it exacerbates inequalities um, both within and between our, our different national research systems. Um, we believe that it fundamentally limits global progress to tackle the immense challenges that the world faces um, and also is a barrier to supporting the diversity of science and the sharing of expertise and learning that we know is fundamental to accelerating progress across um, any field. Also, as a research funder, um, I want to spend our research funding on um, new research um, and it really is unsustainable for us as funders of public funded research um, to absorb the current 
um, escalating costs of open access and scholarly, and scholarly publishing. And for me, a really important example of where something different happened was in COVID, where publishers made um, all papers and print and preprints open access, given the importance um, of um, science and knowledge to inform action. Um, and I think we should be um, looking at that and as example of what is possible um, and really applying the same urgency to the wider issue of scientific access. Um, and um, this area, we've talked about the importance of the Gates action. Um, also, it was a topic um, that was discussed uh, last year um, at the CSA roundtable in G20. And, and similarly, there was um, a, a number of countries that were really um, engaging and thinking about how do we collectively um, uh, try and push and accelerate change. Um, uh, there are a range of different approaches and models. We really welcome what the Gates Foundation is initiating today. Um, I don't think there are easy solutions, but I think as a starter, it's really important that we collectively express our concern, really identify the core principles of um, what we need to achieve um, this progress and also engage in the related issues. So the incentives around academic public, um, promotion and so on that um, currently are linked often to publishing in prestigious journals, but actually where we're starting to see movement and different um, universities and different sectors starting to say, actually, there's different ways that we should think about how do we judge excellent research and um, uh, in, in, and how that links to um, academic promotion. So we have to we have to tackle the incentive. We have a conversation around incentives alongside the conversation around access to publications. I'll end there for now. Excellent. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Moving now to Elizabeth. So, and just as we do, a reminder to the audience that after this, we'll have some Q&A. So this is your opportunity to get questions to the panel. Do go to Slido, upvote the questions that are exist that you're interested in uh, and add your own. So uh, Elizabeth, so as a not only a uh, senior advisor to the Science for Africa Foundation, um, but also the former CEO of PLOS, which is one of the biggest um, open access publishing platforms, uh, what are your thoughts about how open access can drive progress uh, and any reflections on how the Gates policy uh, and approach might stimulate change? Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ashley, for the leadership in this area. The Gates Foundation has long been a leader along with Welcome and some others uh, in uh, pushing for uh, complete open access. I'll try not to be redundant. I'll, I'll just say that I'm very much aligned with all the comments uh, from the Gates Foundation, as well as my colleagues in different part of, parts of the world that have uh, been speaking. At the Science for Africa Foundation, we've been uh, promoting immediate uh, and complete open access. Our platform, Open Research Africa, is a partnership, as is uh, the Gates and Welcome platform with F1000 to enable us to, as Ashley characterizes it, publish, review, curate. In other words, uh, publish first, make content accessible, give it a date stamp uh, so as not to put authors at a disadvantage, not to put readers at a disadvantage, and of course, entirely open access. I think the move to eliminate article processing charges is uh, very welcome and inevitable. I think the uh, vulnerability we see in the uh, changes coming down the line for the Gates Foundation is, of course, and they'd probably be the first ones to say this, is what's going to replace it? How are we going to enable our funded researchers and Africa and all funded researchers throughout the world the opportunity to not just get their work out, give them a date stamp, uh, give them the opportunity to publish their work in all forms, not just the research articles, but also methods, data sets, uh, software, and other research objects. But how can we help them and support them in bypassing the imprimatur of the impact factor? Um, I don't think it's a hard sell to people to convince them that the impact factor is a dysfunctional, even harmful 
a measure of prestige and uh, a, a, an inappropriate endorsement of the quality of work. But the problem is collectively, all of us have failed to offer an alternative which makes the impact factor obsolete. So it's that area that I think is our weak flank. We're all vulnerable and we must uh, not uh, we must not stop at telling people, forget the impact factor, publish open access, uh, forget APCs. The question is, what is the alternative? And um, I very much look forward to working with the Gates Foundation. Our current platform, as is, as is PLOS and others, is based on APCs. I can't wait to uh, join our colleagues in South America and um, and eliminate all APCs. For every submission of a funded researcher we get to our platform, there are probably a hundred submissions of uh, worthwhile work that cannot be published because there's no APC funds available. So I'm very much in support of what uh, the Gates Foundation is offering. I'm glad they've put a, a stake in the ground. Uh, and now I think that what we've got is um, uh, seven months or whatever is left in, in, until this uh, policy comes into effect to uh, finish the analysis and finish the innovative thinking uh, so that we can uh, all be in alignment in terms of how to support researchers in Africa and everywhere in the world to enable them to share their research. I also just want to put in a word uh, in support of justice, uh, the notion of uh, free peer review um, has been um, uh, okay as far as it goes for a long time, but at its core, it's exploitive. People uh, don't even get uh, credit for what they do in many formats, uh, and uh, not to mention uh, compensation for their time and expertise. Uh, Again, I think re our researchers in Africa are particularly disadvantaged from the system. And as we redesign our method of uh, communicating research, let's uh, uh, keep in mind the need to honor, respect, and uh, if necessary, monetize the participation in a new process on behalf of African and all researchers throughout the world. Thank you, Tom. Fantastic. I thank you, Elizabeth. All great stuff. Um, okay, so now moving to Q and A. So we've got very active um, Slido questions. And so yeah, bringing back all of the panelists here. Um, and I will I'll take a little cluster of questions and offer it out. And I'm maybe sort of going to actually first, just in case you have any sort of thoughts, um, sort of given the the sort of opening comments from the other speakers uh, as well but so just to take a, a little cluster of questions so we've got uh what are some of the unintended consequences uh of the bmgf policy refresh in your respective fields uh, how do you anticipate managing shifts in resulting from these changes that's question one two researchers are going to want to publish in prestigious journals how can research funders square this with the need to improve and therefore uh, disrupt the sector we've touched on the, some of that already i know but if anyone wanted to sort of um to say more about that you're welcome yeah and thirdly um i'll just do just do an, another three okay, okay. <laughs> uh thirdly the uh, availability of alternative funding for article processing charges may be more accessible to authors from high income countries potentially exacerbating disparities compared to authors from low and middle income countries who may lack such resources how do you perceive this issue and its implications for equity and research publishing slightly longer one there but i think it's clear Brilliant. Ashley, over to you. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Those are those are really great questions. Uh, one thing I want to uh, just make clear. So uh, our resources from the Gates Foundation uh, website and our official blog post announcement won't come out until 1 p.m. today. So if you're looking right now, nothing's been updated. We'll get to that soon. Uh, and then I also, in hearing the discussions, and this does also tie into the answers, uh, for the questions, as, as I think we often overlook, and I also didn't include enough in my presentation, that there are successful uh, diamond models, there are successful uh, open access models that don't require 
um, egregious APCs, and I think those often get overlooked in the scheme of things, and we should be uh, highlighting those successes. And there is a lot to already learn and, and build from, and that's why we feel uh, more confident to make such a bold uh, shift. And I think the you know, uh, one of the in unintended consequences that we are definitely aware of and tracking is that it results in more uh, like a version of record paywall and what that means for Elmic authors trying to get access to information. And that's a, it's a hard thing to reconcile. I think we've come to a place where preprints are more socialized. We have better tools to educate and help find information more easily so we don't have to rely on just the journal access. We're building up repository uh, access and support. And I think that's a really important part of, of the ecosystem. But we really looked at, especially when we think about changing incentive system, if we're willing to pay upwards to $12,000 for a single article, uh, knowing that the peer review is not paid for by the journal, that the authors are not paid, that we're really sending a strong signal that that's of importance to us because that's where we're putting our money. And I think that's what's the most critical shift and thing to stop um, right now. And um, yeah, and uh, I had another point, but it's okay. I'll come back to it. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone want to to dive in, or shall I? Okay, Charlotte, take off the the mark. Go for it, Charlotte. Yeah, I mean, just to say, um, uh, just to pick up on Ashley's point, I think you know there's a range of different models, and I think we really need to be learning from different approaches, um, both about you know what do they achieve, but also just starting to understand how this plays out and the risk of unintended consequences. So we're excited by the gate stance, but also then clean to say, well, actually, let's let's see how this, what the implications are. As I said before, I do think in parallel to what donors can do, it's also universities and academic systems um, need to have this conversation about actually how do we value and recognize merit and that it's not simply an impact factor. And, and I know in my own institution, um, we've agreed to principles that um, are really looking at the quality of the work rather than using a proxy of a particular publication in a journal as a way of assessing um, uh, research staff. So I think as we move forward, we really do have to engage with the, that aspect of, of, of this sort of in, you know, complex interactive system um, to really achieve change, because while the incentives are that um, publishing in a in a top journal, irrespective of a price of price, gives you a, you know, is important for your promotion, um, things won't change. Thank you, um, Justice Elizabeth. Anything you want to pull out from that set? Uh, I I think we're in uh, heated agreement here. Again, I just want to keep hold ourselves accountable for what is next uh, wow. because the, that's the weak part of the argument here. It's true that there are some successful uh, diamond open access uh, initiatives going on, but they're nascent. They're, you know, they're, they're really not time tested and we need to do better. Those that rely on, uh, Volunteer editing, for example, are fine as far as they go, uh, but we're going to have a hard time, as Charlotte says, um, uh, assuring people that their work will be respected when shared on this basis. Mm -hmm. That's the gap that we have to bridge, and it, it's an opportunity for innovative thinking. I'm totally supportive directionally. Uh, and uh, look forward to figuring out how to get to the other side of this argument. Anything you want to add on this one, Justice, or should we go to the next step? Just uh, sounds good. Okay, so um, first one on the next set, could you see other research funders adopting uh, a similar approach? I guess particularly relevant one for you, Charlotte, but interesting to hear comments from Justice and Elizabeth as well. And, you know, what will be the the challenges of, of, of other funders following suit? Uh, and then secondly, um, 
how do you think AI, you know, obviously this is a sort of um, uh, another sort of new era we're sort of getting into here. How, how will AI interface with changes in, in research publishing reform? Or what are the challenges, but maybe opportunities um, there as well? So I'll just give it two on, on that one because they're quite big picture. Does anyone want to be first to, to take either that research funders or AI? Um, I mean, I can come in on the funders just to say, I mean, we are really keen to learn as um, uh, I'm, I'm here actually visiting the Gates Foundation now. And um, I'm really, um, we will be looking very closely at um, how this rolls out and, and be wanting to learn from that. Um, and in our G20 conversations with a range of different countries who are funding publicly uh, publicly funding uh, you know funders of research similarly we're um, trying to learn from other countries um, different countries um, approaches to this to uh, to um, uh, because our view is there probably isn't a sort of one size fits all but actually there are essentially a number of common principles to what we're all trying to achieve through different open access policies and you know it's just how do we move forward together Going on to AI, I think AI is a really interesting issue. Um, I think it will disrupt the whole publication model potentially quite fundamentally. Um, and so um, the hope is that we'll um, provide one of the vehicles to accelerate progress on um, access to information um, and research publications um, around the world. And actually one of the things we're investing in linked to AI is just how do we accelerate ability to translate science findings or any types of publications into multiple languages, because that is also an aspect um, that's important to ensuring that everybody can access um, information and, and uh, research findings. Thank you very much. Um, Justice, any thoughts on um, issues for research funders or the role of AI? It's just so research funders, um, yeah, I believe the research funders will need to respond to that. And I'm happy that uh, <laughs> Elizabeth responded. Obviously, we at Africa CDC, um, we are looking, we are we are following the uh, the changes that are happening and we are looking with interest. Um, we are obviously keen on ensuring that, in ensuring that uh, the space, there's a level playing field. Um, you know, both for our academic community, but also for the policy community, uh, so that people can, uh, whether compete or you know, really get onto this space. So we are hoping that other funders uh, follow suit, um, or at least make their intentions known around uh, these issues and. Um, and 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 we will appropriately uh, respond based on how this this evolves. Um, for AI, obviously, AI is disrupting uh, a lot of things, including research and um, and research publishing. Uh, we know there are the big publishing groups, um, especially if you come to Africa. There are the there are, there are big groups that like Science Direct and others that really um, lead in terms of in terms of coverage in terms of use on the continent mainly depending on the uh, the APC also um, but again how how will these discussions about the availability of evidence and even use, even the desire of people to use evidence change when we bring, we consider what AI has to, has to um, bring in. I guess we probably need another platform to discuss this whole, um, this whole, whole issue of how AI, um, you know, disrupts the space and actually challenging, uh, challenges us to be better. So we, we, we will keep looking towards, um, you know, what emerges from these conversations and these actions. Over. Thank you very much. Um, can I just offer this, these ones up to Elizabeth? And no, it's not like that. 
Uh, I, yeah, I, like I would be happy to say a couple things. I mean, of course, I think uh, collective action and approaches is really important in this space. So having uh, funders adopt similar stances or uh, policies, I think, goes a long way. And that's where we've kind of seen the most change uh, happen. And I think the challenge is there is, um, you know, understanding the complexities, wanting to avoid unintended consequences, but that sometimes means that we then take no action at, at all. And that's also an, an issue. Uh, one thing I wanted to say in the last question is like, I think one of the good things about, you know, we've always had approach of kind of experimentation in this space through policy. And one of the good things about APCs is we've able to see kind of this cost burden in prestige publishing and really can understand that. Um, and then not to forget that libraries have been paying and carrying this burden uh, for far too long. And so I think that's another way that we want to really shift this is to better understand all the different flows of money now and how can we uh, better direct and, and use them. And then as far as as AI goes, that's a that's a very big topic. Uh, I you know I do agree with all the the other comments. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, I you know, as we think about how to leverage that technology, you know, we're looking at things to be able to do a lot of automated checks to improve, you know, the information contained within an article or any other kind of information artifact and do checks that way, but also being really important that, you know, we don't want to get rid of the human element. And I'm a little worried in our, you know, effort to try to keep costs down, uh, that there's a lot of cutting corners when the technology isn't developed enough. Um, so cognizant of, of that as well, but um, you know, we've we've already seen, I think, in a lot of senses that these things are being used, tools are being used by researchers. Chappy GPT is one that we see a lot. I think it's, it has a potential to save a lot of time and resources, and that can be redirected to the really tough uh, things that we need to do. So there's a lot of potential there as well. But uh, again, when we talk about unintended consequences, I think uh, AI can can have lots of those. Brilliant. Thank you, Elizabeth. If you want to dive in on those, feel free, or I can take a new set if you feel it's all being covered. Um, I don't have anything particularly original to say, so why don't you use the uh, time in a better way? Yeah. Let's squeeze in more questions then. Okay, so um, what kind of new technology and infrastructure do you think is needed to support these new changes towards more equitable ecosystem? That's uh, number one. Um, second, this is sort of somewhat related to some of the things we've already talked about as well, but publishers are now facing a huge number of research integrity issues, e.g. paper mills. Um, how can we make sure that preprint servers deal with these issues? And I guess that goes, there's sort of something in there about quality assessment and curation and are there sort of different models that don't look like the old style journals. Um, but research and so integrity, I suppose, is the, is the second question. And then thirdly, um, and maybe again related, how how can you how can journals or something like journals operate without um, the article processing charges? Can you please clarify the financing model you envision without APCs? Um, so maybe in that last one sort of leads nicely back to Ashley, but then I'll, I'll sort of yeah. give, give Elizabeth the next bite at it um, after that. Great. Yeah, I think in the the APC question is is a tough one, and we don't have quite a perfect answer yet. But um, and I take Elizabeth's you know comment that there are nascent examples, but I do think there are strong examples uh, to learn from, and I th I think they've been often too quickly dismissed or overlooked because it doesn't fit into uh, kind of how we publish and evaluate and view prestige in the global north especially, and that's a huge uh, issue. So I, I do think that the the diamond model or having, you know, more of subsidized uh, publishing platforms, working with closely with nonprofits, I think that is, is uh, an important way forward. I think too, if we spend and have less reliance on the most expensive publishing routes that will also help redirect those those funds. Uh, I am a huge fan of the subscribed open model as well. And I think for something that is quite new and is happening and, you know, especially when we talk about 
open access and costs, uh, the humanities is, is usually the discipline where this is the hardest to do, but we're also seeing some of the coolest, strongest examples of that collective funding and the subscribe to open model. Um, there was a, a piece shared yesterday in the scholarly kitchen that I think outlines the different type of open access models there are. And so that, that helps us in talking through and having experimentation there. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm envisioning. Um, as far as the technologies, I mean, I think, especially as we, you know, I, I think a lot of the publishing technology we have now is, is quite archaic. So I'm very excited that if, if we kind of get out of those systems, there's so much we could do and accomplish and those could build in those kind of quality checks that we want. I don't, I don't think that the, you know, post publication kind of peer review model is, is, uh, you know, or, or that um, the traditional model is, is working anymore to keep up with all that. When we see a lot of this research integrity come out post publication, um, we've taken a look at our current preprints, you know, kind of to assess, you know, what, are there any concerns or any flags? We've had, you know, one that ended up being retracted from a preprint server, but the version of record still has no marks of concern on it and is not retracted. So I often think that um, preprint servers can be much, much more agile in that space for correcting. And that's, that's an important aspect that uh, as we continue to see more use and research and data coming out about uh, preprints and their use and how they change uh, over time, uh, I think we'll learn learn a lot there, and I'll I'll stop there. Thanks, Ashley. Elizabeth, do you want to dive in on that? I'll add something with regard to research integrity. There is clearly uh, already a lot of technological tools we could use from uh, plagiarism checks to um, uh, 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 data sets and that kind of thing. So that's a constantly uh, evolving area. I would say in terms of how it's make how we will make this work, I think we're all floundering to some degree. Um, but um, in the big picture, I think there really is potential to redirect some of those billions of dollars that go into the publishing industry, primarily the commercial publishing industry, but to some degree, the not-for-profit publishing industry as well. Uh, and redirect those funds to uh, individuals who currently are doing all kinds of work for free, particularly in editing and peer reviewing. Um, there may be uh, not to in any way trivialize the process, but I'm just thinking about uh, the money flow. There's an opportunity for um, a gig solution here in terms of uh, peer review. Uh, where we can redirect some of that money to those very hardworking, uh, uh, typically, let's just say, postdocs and labs who are doing all of this work uh, for no uh, visibility, uh, no remuneration, and uh, it, no reward in terms of their own career. They should be visible, they should be rewarded, and perhaps they should be rewarded tangibly. There, it, as Ashley has been saying, there's money in the system. It's not a matter of allocating new resources. It's a matter of redirecting the money that there is. And if I can read between the lines, it sounds like Ashley is issuing a challenge on behalf of the foundation. Somebody find a better way to use all this money that we're already putting into the system rather than in the um, exploitive um, uh, structure that we've all been beholden to. It's just a great opportunity right now. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, Justice or Shulis, if you want to dive in on that, feel free. Otherwise, we're approaching the end and I've got sort of just last set up questions that we can go to as well. But let me not move over those ones if there is some burning comment you wanted to make on those questions? No, I will, I will add my comment to my last um, one minute. So Sounds good. So, so as a sort of last set of questions, well, I should say, so there have been some, like a set of very kind of specific questions about the policy. And I think I'm not going to raise those here because it probably the best thing is for them to just refer to the Gates Foundation's website, which, um, as Ashley says, will be going live a little bit later today. But to, to sort of 
go big picture again, really. Um, so the shift is the foundation ship is an interesting step. It's a sort of you know um, uh, a more radical approach than many research funders take. But a, you know, change in a complex system like global research publishing is going to need high-level leadership and international cooperation. You know, beyond any single funder. So, what do you see as the main opportunities for improving leadership uh, and towards reforming sort of global research publishing as a as a, sort of a global system? Related to that, perhaps you know, how can there be a shift from the perception of this issue from a sort of a niche concern for academics to seeing it as this kind of global foundational system which underpins the use of evidence in policy, uh, sort of innovation for technical or economic development and, and so on. So so some sort of big picture questions, but then I'll, if I go to each of you with that, if you want to say anything ab about those, but also give sort of a short one minute kind of closing reflections or, or call to action or however you want to to wrap up so let me go in um the same order that we started with so if i start with ashley and then i'll come through justice charlotte and then elizabeth so ashley mg yes yeah so those are two really important questions that um i hope we develop better and stronger answers for i mean i've i've consistently wanted one more of a public campaign because I think there are a lot of groups outside of our our research uh, areas and our communities um, that are really invested in and really believe knowledge is a public good. I think we need to work closer with libraries. I, I think uh, there's a lot of patient advocacy groups and elements there. Uh, so I think really better, better coordination across all of those, I think, would help bring this out of being more of a niche concern because so much of the world really does operate based off of this knowledge base and information. And so I think it's it's critical to have larger buy-in. As far as leadership goes, I think a lot of groups like, like this and the experts that are on this call work really hard to bring it up in important policy debates and discussions and that work um, is very valuable and so continuing to do that and we're always working with our leadership to encourage them to make sure that this is kind of an underlying theme in all of the discussions and work uh, that we do and then my my call to action uh, would be of course you know those that are able to take bold steps as well or even doing something so small is signaling support and importance of this uh, of this change and work to to their circles uh, goes a long way and please post preprints thanks brilliant thank you ashley now to justice Thanks, and um, I, I'll just tell the or support what Ashley said and what you said. Uh, this kind of a response, uh, you know, requires a very coordinated um, and planned well, response. Um, so we do hope that uh, it won't just be the Gates Foundation who ha who is doing this, but other funding platforms um, or other funders will, will, will follow suit. And as Ashley said, it will be very important to get the people who matter involved. I mean, the libraries, um, academic partners, and even the generals themselves. Um, of course, we need to move one step at a time. And I do know that is a question of what happens to funding for for publishers, what alternative funding sources. Um, that is, is another problem that we need to be dealt with. But of course, we need to move one at a time. Let me state that um, I am not, and I have not, and, and other African researchers have not necessarily called for, you know, reviewers to be remunerated or paid. <laughs> but the point the difficult point really is because, you know, if we review, we review the work of peers, of other people, whether they are in LMICs or not. But the point really is about reviewing, submitting your own work, wanting, to, you know, you, being asked to pay for publishing your own work and being asked to review what other people or access what other people have done. So um, I think that for me, I want to make that uh, very clear. Um, 
what should we be doing? Or what are the next steps? I think we, we expect more from other funders. And I do hope that in the next year or two, um, as the Gates policy rolls out, um, other big funders such as the NIH, um, the Wellcome Trust, and other bilateral funders will, will take steps, you know, to move in this, in this direction. We need to see something change about research publishing. We cannot keep talking about inequity or equity when we ourselves are not doing anything. And for this, I commend the Gates Foundation. And I think it's a challenge for other funders. It's also a challenge for journals to take a step. I know a few have taken some steps, but they need to take some steps uh, to rectify some of these, these inequity, issues of inequity. Over. Thank you, Justice. And in the last few minutes, now Charlotte. Yeah, I mean, this is not a niche issue. It might feel like it, but it really isn't because fundamentally access to evidence, to research findings um, and ensuring it's open to all is is, is critical. Um, I'm really excited by the, the step that the foundation has um, taken. I was also really excited at that this was a topic um, at G20 conversations. Um, I think we need to go further. We need to go faster. It's complex. I think we need all of us to work together um, and, and for others to come on board. And that includes universities, researchers, um, as well as publishers in really saying, how do we agree the principles and make, make progress to really ensuring equitable access? Brilliant. Thank you very much. And last, absolutely not least elizabeth um i'll just add that um i get i take the point about uh it being a niche issue on some levels we we who care about research communications have been uh talking to each other about this for a long time but i would suggest that we need uh to make common cause with organizations and advocates for good government in general, because let's not forget that all of this science is generated directly or indirectly on the public dime. And uh, in that sense, everybody should care about research communication. It is not a good use of public money, whatever public we're talking about, to uh, drive these profit margins at commercial publishers. It's just uh, we must protect the taxpaying citizenry of the world. Uh, so um, if, if people aren't in the world of science, they still have a stake in this. And uh, I just lastly, I'll add, we cannot underestimate the power of publishing lobbyists. Uh, they really... Uh, fought us and, and my orientation in this regard, because uh, I was at PLOS at the time, is the US Congress. They really fought uh, the introduction of open access because they uh, correctly saw it being a, a threat to their um, business model. And I think we need to be prepared to take them on at the highest government levels. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, on that note, I will just thank all of you again. Looking forward to uh, the next steps on all of this and uh, hoping for, for you know, serious and meaningful reform uh, to research publishing to facilitate better access to evidence for, for everyone in the coming years. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you.